In this video, we are going to watch together a video from the Wall Street Journal where um, they speak about uh, the current bottleneck at the Panama Canal. This is actually a big, big issue. Imagine that uh, you have a, a year-long contract with a client and because of this bottleneck, the freight are shooting up, you are maybe losing money on your contract and so on. And also, on a, overall, I think the Panama Canal has like more than 10,000 transit a year, something like this. So you can imagine the volume that goes through this uh, canal in those times of high inflation. Uh, this is not good news. So let's watch this video. To be honest, I don't know exactly what is going on with the Panama Canal, so I hope to learn more. Uh, and as always, I will um, stop the video and give you my hopefully entertaining and insightful comment about what we see. Um, this is the first time that I watch something from the Wall Street Journal, so I don't know if they are left-leaning, right-leaning, we'll, <laughs> we'll see. And yeah, let's see what's going on with the Panama Canal. My spidey sense is that uh, this is there is like a massive mismanagement of the canal, like what happened with the Suez Canal, uh, and that's the main reason, but they are going to blame something else. Let's see. <laughs> let's go. One of the world's biggest traffic jams isn't on a road or highway. It's at the Panama Canal. By the end of August, a backlog of more than 200 ships waited for weeks to pass through the waterway. So, so 200 ships is, it's insane. I mean, this is a huge, huge backlog. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is not trivial. I mean, it's a real issue. For more than 20 days. We handle about $600 billion worth of merchandise through the Panama Canal. And this vital trade route is at risk. The cause? A historic drought. The delays are rippling through the global economy as lower water levels cut into shipping times and bottom lines. Here's how the Panama Canal is adapting to a drier planet. Okay, so uh, first of all, we start right into the climate change uh, thing, okay? But I don't understand why um, the Panama Canal, they use fresh water for the deadlocks. Uh, let, let, let's see, I don't, I don't get it. And what those changes mean for the global supply chains and industries that depend on it. When the Panama Canal first opened in 1914, it was a game changer for the shipping industry. A little job connecting the Atlantic and Pacific. For the first time, Cargo ships could save about five days traveling between the Atlantic and Pacific, bypassing this treacherous journey around the tip of South America. By connecting two oceans, countries with vast distances between them could now compete in global trade. But as the canal runs out of water, canal operators like Ricuarte Vasquez are scrambling to protect the route. Vasquez is the head administrator for the Panama Canal Authority, which maintains and operates the waterway. We handle about 55% of all containers that go to the United States from Asia. Yeah, so this is huge. Like half of the trade from uh, US to Asia goes to the Panama Canal. And I mean, you can easily understand if it comes from Asia, then and it goes to the east coast of uh, the US, then of course it goes through the Panama. We do that in about 13,000 transits per year yeah. in regular time. Ships like this one are elevated to about 85 feet above sea level through a system of locks, and then lowered down on the other end. Every time a ship passes through, as much as 120 million gallons of water are lost to the sea. That's enough to fill as many as 244 Olympic-sized swimming I, Again, why, why are they using fresh water? I, I don't get it. Pools. All of that water comes from a system of freshwater reservoirs and rivers that depend on rainfall. It operates on fresh water, which is a major difference compared to any other major waterway in the world. We cannot pump water from the oceans into the lake. Even though Panama is the- Okay, okay, now I understand. So basically they use the lake as a reservoir to then send the fresh water to the, the deadlocks, you know, to level up or level down the, the thing. But you know what? I'm pretty sure that as of today, we can send satellite people on the moon. So I'm pretty sure that you can pump directly uh, water out of the ocean and put them to use your deadlock. I'm sure it's feasible. 
come on. Of course, it's going to cost uh, obviously billions. Uh, maybe you need to add artificial reservoir that will be filled with um, with salt water. But come on, man, this, this is not undoable. The world's fifth rainiest country, it no longer has a steady supply of fresh water. Over the last 20 years, there is a downward trend in water precipitation. We were 89 feet over sea level. Nowadays, we are 79 feet over sea level. So that is a 10 feet reduction on the lake level in a relatively sizable lake. Lower water levels are a problem for cargo ships that sometimes carry as many as 16,000 containers at a time. If ships are too heavy, they risk getting trapped in the canal. We have to introduce draft restrictions, which imposes that every vessel has to come lighter or with less cargo in order to sail through the Panama Canal. A ship's draft limit is the minimum depth of water a vessel can safely navigate. This decides how much cargo a vessel can carry without getting stuck. As drought conditions worsened over the summer, the waterway reduced its draft limit from 50 feet to 44. For a container vessel, on the average, every feet of draft represents about 300 to 350 containers. Since May, large container vessels, like this one, have had to reduce cargo loads by as much as 25%. That, of course, means that we can offer less capacity uh, to our customers as a result of this. Lars Ustegard Nielsen is the head of customer delivery in the Americas at Maersk, the world's second largest cargo shipping carrier in terms of capacity. We actually sail extra ships to fill in the blanks. Because we lose this six feet of water, we lose an opportunity to load some cargo. Other ship owners are adjusting to the restrictions by offloading their cargo onto trains. The boxes are unloaded from ships on one side of the canal, moved by rail, and returned to the vessels before they continue their voyage. But the system doesn't work for all cargo ships. If you are a bulk carrier, you take in coal, grain, there is no way to unload. So you have to come light, and you come light from origin, then you look for another port of destination to increase your cargo and then take it to the final destination. In an effort to save even more water, the canal has limited the amount of vessels that are allowed to pass through each day. But fewer ships traveling through the canal means longer wait times and higher tolls. Shipping executives say container vessels now pay around $400,000 to cross the waterway. That includes a freshwater surcharge of more than 10% meaning the lower the water levels, the more shipping companies have to pay. So far, what we have tried is to reduce from 36 transits per day to 32 transits per day. So there are a lot less spaces to have an option for standby customers. Of the 30 slots, or 32 slots that we offer, about 28 of them are already booked. Container ships that are able to book in advance typically aren't impacted by these types of bottlenecks. But vessels that aren't on fixed routes, like bulk and gas carriers that move cargo on short notice, face the longest wait times. Yeah, so basically what uh, they explain is like um, for the big container ship, we know their route like every cup, uh, like there's two vessels per week that do the route. So basically MSC, MERS, CMA, all the big ship um, container uh, shippers, they can just book the route because they know they will have demand for that. Then on the other side, there's all those spot trade, like the uh, most of the time, this is commodity, you know, they don't really have like long, I mean, some of them are on long yearly contract, but there's a lot of spot trade and spot mid, means it at that moment. So if you, I don't know, do a spot trade from some coal out of uh, South America and you want to ship it to, to, to US, um, then you will have to use the Panama Canal. But as he explained, there's less spot for, for those type of cargo. So that means that they have to wait, but one month waiting, this is huge. I, I don't know um, the rate, or the, the daily rate of those uh, the ships uh, now, but it could be like uh, 5,000 uh, US dollar a day that you could uh, lose by waiting. Uh, or maybe it's a bit low, I don't know, because the freight uh, rate are really low, but I mean, this is a, a huge issue. The delays for these types of non-booked vessels increased 280% since June. That's according to Project 44, a supply chain visibility platform. On top of the delays, bulk carriers are also facing higher auction fees. There are now an opportunity to go into an auction where you can basically bid for getting access to these limited uh, time slots that were not booked early. 
Now those auctions have gone uh, the highest I have seen and the highest number we have seen is a level of $900,000. To make up for the higher costs, ship owners are charging customers about $600 more per cargo container. There's no doubt that the canal is very important for global trade. If the canal was not there, then that would essentially add more cost, it would add delays. Disruptions in the canal's operations could hurt southern hemisphere exporters and northern importers. Brazilian meat, Chilean wines, and bananas from Ecuador are regularly shipped across the canal. Copper from Chile and natural gas from the U.S. Gulf Coast transit the waterway too. It's also one of the fastest and least expensive ways to move grain and other agricultural commodities, which leave the port of New Orleans for China. About 73% of all the traffic passing through the canal is either headed for or leaving the United States. But shipping executives say increasing transit times and costs are leading some bulk carriers to seek out alternate routes. Vessels carrying products to customers in Asia may sail through the Suez Canal or around the Cape of Good Hope, adding one to two weeks to the journey. It's basically your products that's in brake bulk or in, in tankers. So this could be oil, it could be uh, natural gas, it could be grain products. For now, Maersk and other large container ship companies have no plans to divert their core shipments away from Panama. Still, executives say it's not off the table if drought conditions worsen. Yes, we have a problem. We acknowledge this will impair your operation. But in order to minimize the adverse effect of it, we are providing the information so you make the best decision based on real data on real time. The canal's future now hinges on a $2 billion plan to divert as many as four additional rivers into the waterway. That's in addition to the three rivers that already feed it. But adding new reservoirs is a costly and lengthy undertaking. New water would have to come from watersheds that are farther from the canal, requiring the construction of tunnels as well as dams. River diversions also put pressure on the region's limited water sources, which support over 2 million people and the surrounding rainforest ecosystems. Ultimately, canal operators are working to maintain a balance between the water needs of the canal, the environment, and Panama's growing urban population. We have to make provisions to support. I still don't understand why they cannot pump the uh, salty water from the ocean rather than using fresh water. I must be too too stupid. Definitely. Apply fresh water or water consumption well in advance economic growth and population growth. There is a slight competition between water for transit and water for human consumption. The Panama Canal Authority is also investing in new infrastructure outside of the waterway. We are thinking about roads, we are thinking about storage facilities, we are thinking about complementary services to be provided for cargoes that can wait in Panama to find the final destination. These changes were meant to be carried out over 25 years, but administrators say drought and changing weather patterns has cut that timeline down to 10. Canal operators see this crisis as an opportunity to fast track critical infrastructure buildouts. The opportunity is now because there is a, a high level of awareness of the situation. People have a sense of what the value of not having fresh water means. Okay, so, so that was a quite actually a good um, small documentary. I, I like it, but I, I think, I don't know, Panama, uh, you know, the situation in Panama, but it's always like, the problem is always politic. And the fact that they use like fresh water to, to pump this, I mean, it makes no sense. Yeah, so I think that was a very, very good um, uh, mini documentary about what is going on in, in the, the Panama Canal. And I think what is more likely to carry on, because uh, I mean, draw will not stop. Uh, and I don't think that we'll find a solution <laughs> quickly in Panama. So yeah. What do you think about the situation? Have you been impacted by that? Because I, honestly, I don't really trade with the US, so for me, uh, I, mean, I didn't really know about it before watching it. Uh, so yeah, let me know, guys. Ciao.